This is a little presentation I put together a while back about pressure testing uh, transmissions. Because uh, we're in automatic transmission day, so everybody pay attention to this particular presentation. You should be able to find the answers to those as we go. Okay? So you get that, so pay attention here. You might notice we got slow idle, fast idle, and wide open throttle in our little table here that we built ourselves. Now, whenever you're, we talked about stall testing, uh, which is basically something you do to see if you, it's a test you can do to check to see if your uh, torque converter stator overrunning clutch, you know, the middle part of the torque converter that I showed you guys that has a one-way clutch, if that one-way clutch is bad, you don't get torque multiplication, your stall speed will be low, telling you you got a bad torque converter. Um, but whenever you're doing these pressure tests, you're actually supposed to be doing them in three different, you know, and this is kind of slightly old school stuff, but I mean, it's been up until lately. Slow idle, fast idle, and wide open throttle. Wide open throttle, you notice wide open throttle, you don't get numbers in park and neutral because it's silly to go to wide open throttle and park in neutral. You lock your park brake, you mash your service brake really hard, and then you set your park brake while you got your service brake mashed. That'll typically let it go tighter. So <clears throat> if you're trying to do a uh, stall speed test, and some of you guys have already done this, haven't you? Where you put it in gear and you got your put, you know, you got this lock where it can't go anywhere, and you go all the way to the floor long enough to see where that feels. Well, you're going to watch the pressure while you're at stall. And if that's at your wide open throttle, and it's only in your, you know, reverse, and reverse will typically be a little higher in your other gear. If you make this little table here like this, and you're going to fill that out as you go. And this is going to be, there's little particulars about that, so build or draw a table like that one. Now, it's best to start pressure tests with line pressure. Uh, first, main line pressure should be checked in each range at, uh, at idle. Park, neutral, you know, that should be our uh, reverse neutral drive, three, two, one. You know, check it in all those ranges. Make, make sure you need to know where to connect the gauge. You notice there's a different on this particular transaxle here, which is for a Ford. Uh, EPC and line pressure are two separate taps. These are little one-eighth pipe plugs. You screw those out of there, you put your gauge in there, and you're reading live pressure. You got it? All right. So first make sure you know where to connect the pressure gauge. That's basically what I was saying there. And if you go to, um, like this is a little all data thing, component tests and general diagnostics, that's typically where you'll find stuff like that. Uh, now, if you're high at idle in all ranges, your wire and harnesses, your EPC solenoid, and um, let me uh, send him a, uh, I'll have to call him back. All right, low at idle in all ranges, low fluid, fluid in it or filter seal. Valve body issues, cross leaks, in other words, leaks from one channel to the other. Gaskets, pump, separator plate. If it's low in park only, you've got valve body issues. Low in reverse only. Now, let me ask you this. How does your valve body know which gear you're in? Anybody remember from our last session? That speed thing. It's got a little spool valve called the main valve. And it basically moves and channels the fluid to various different parts of the valve body depending on whether you remember that. It's a spool valve. It's directly connected to your pernal stick. You know what the pernal stick is. That's the thing that goes park reverse. And and all that. Back in the ages ago, reverse used to be all the way on the bottom and then drive was up here on the top. And that really caused some issues when I decided to change that one year. Some people ran through the back of the garages and all that. Um, low and reverse only, you got a separator plate issue, reverse clutch, valve body, forward clutch. See, this is kind of giving you a little possible cause stuff. You can find this in a lot of your stuff. Now, there's some really good aftermarket stuff. There's some apps you can get on your phone that will help you with some of the automatic transmission diagnosis and all that. So I start sniffing around for that. Pretty good stuff. Um, low and drive only, forward clutch. And then forward clutch your valve. But if you know which one of those clutches in that transmission is a forward clutch, and you're seeing this particular symptom, you can focus on that clutch when you get in there and look and see what's split, what's broke, what's cracked, what's hard, what's missing, this kind of thing. Wide open throttle stall. Find your specs first. They're giving you the specs right here of what it's supposed to be. Electronic pressure control is what the computer controls it with a little, a little variable force solenoid that it applies current to. And, Whenever you uh, take power away from the electronic uh, pressure control solenoid, which way does the pressure go? If you blow the fuse, or if you cut the wire, or if you unplug it, which way is the pressure going to go? Last time I asked this question, you answered it right. Does it go low? Up. Oh, it's going to go high because it wants to protect the clutches so they don't slip. All right. All right. So 
Wide open throttle stall must be done with a park brake lock and a heavy foot on the service brake pedal if the wheels spin the test is invalid. Don't do it with spinning wheels. Don't do it with broke motor mounts. Don't do it if the car, you know, if it's not safe to do that. Uh, press the accelerator pedal to the floor in each range, record RPM, reach any range. Don't maintain wide open throttle in any range for more than five seconds or damage to the torque converter mirror. So this is just very brief, okay? All right. One of the guys one time, you know, the little worker sable we got out here? And this has been like 10 years ago. I said, all right, bring this thing up to 1500 RPM because we want to watch the oxygen sensor switch. And to him, bringing it up to 1500 RPM was go all the way to the floor and come back to 1500 RPM or something. Anyway, whenever he pushed the pedal all the way to the floor, this is an old car with tons of miles on it. He goes all the way to the floor, he gets pedal six under the floor mat, and he throws two rods out of the engine right there in the stall, and everybody just about jumped over the workbenches because it was so loud. It sounded like a bomb going off. <laughs> and all that. So we had to build another engine for that car. But, um, anyway, uh, this is basically, your, look at your stall speed numbers. 1860 to 2200 is a 3 liter 2 valve. If it's a 3 liter 4 valve, it's a little higher because you got a stronger engine there too, and a super high output. Uh, show engine would be uh, 224, I mean 2860 to 3240. See, the more powerful the engine, the higher the stall speed. Now you might notice some of these racing nuts will get have torque converters at a high, the, like 3500 stall speed. Now they're, what they're wanting is they want the stall speed to be right there in the power curve of the engine, so that they've got that same brake torque and it's screaming along here at 30, at 3500, 3600, whatever it is, and then they jerk their foot off the brake and they hop off the line. And that's how that works with a little skinny. You'll see them, little bitty torque converters. I mean, there ain't very much to them. All right. When doing a stall test, always observe safety precautions to check broken mounts or bad brakes. Uh, anytime you get in a car, if you mash the brake pedal and feel like the brakes are weak, you better be really, really, really careful whatever you're doing there because you crash and burn. All right. The stall speed in reverse will be lower, uh, but the pressure will be higher. Isn't that interesting? All right. So pressure at wide open throttle stall in reverse. Look at that. 265 to 328, that's pressure on your gauge that you're looking at. All right, and this right here, your EPC, see, is going to be always right along there. Uh, your stall speed line pressure is going to be 208 to 257 in all those gears. Now, the, the service bay diagnostic machi machine used to have a, a little routine that we would run through where we'd hook a transducer into that transmission line, and I would do that, and it would store it on the screen in a graph. It would give me those stall speed, and I'd do uh, troubleshooting on those like that. If all pressures are within spec and slow idle, the pump and pressure regulator are functioning properly. Look at your test. You may find a question about that. If all pressures are within specification at slow idle, then the pump and pressure regulator are functioning properly. These are general rules. Now, there's going to be little things different from one transmission to the next. If all pressures are low at slow idle, it indicates a potential problem in the pump, pressure regulator, filter, low fluid, or internal leakage. How many of you know what it feels like when your transmission's got low fluid? How can you tell? Without even pulling the dipstick, you got low fluid. There's a couple of ways. Then it kind of like rev up a little bit in automatic and then it goes. Yeah, exactly. And particularly when the engine's cold because the fluid hadn't swelled up. And it's, you know, lower. So you, you get in and crank it up, boom, 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 and then it grabs. And that's a pretty good, and that won't always mean low fluid, but the first place I'm going to go is pull the dipstick. I'm checking for fluid when I see that. What else? If you're driving along and you go around a corner and it goes into neutral for a second, it feels like, and then it catches again. You know, we have seen some with the dipsticks in them that were the wrong dipstick, and it actually wouldn't have as much fluid in it because they were the fluid, the dipstick was too long. And if you ever feel one neutralize it when you go around a curve, add another quart of fluid and see if it still, if it still does it. <laughs> you know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't do it, then you'll know why it was low on fluid because you know. Now the ones that don't have a dipstick, it's tricky. You know, my, my vehicle, uh, if you went by the book, you would think my vehicle had, you remember when the radiator was leaking transmission fluid? A little o ring? Uh, and I actually, actually took that little center plug and it was dripping out of there with the engine running and the and transmission warm. I said, well, that tells me that according to the book, it's got plenty of fluid in it. But it would actually do crazy stuff sometimes because it was too low. And so I put another, you know, quart of fluid in it and it was okay. It had been leaking for a long time before I even realized it was leaking. To help verify what the problem is, check pressures at fast idle. If all the pressure read normally fast idle, it usually indicates a worn pump, but the problem could still be internal leaks. If you're pressuring up any kind of a hydraulic circuit and there's a leak somewhere in it, isn't the pressure going to be low? Right? Or you got a problem with your pressure regulator valve? Of course, most of the time your electronic pressure control solenoid, you know, is going to 
will play into that uh, equation too. Now look at your line of pressure there at idle, say 146, 60 to 84, 78 to uh, 108, see those pressures? This is kind of giving you a little, on this particular transmission, and this is on the AX4N I was showing you earlier. And I have the application chart for that transmission handy too. It's really important that you know this. Now see, there's nothing in park is doing anything. There's nothing in neutral is doing anything. When you put it in reverse, your direct clutch is on, and your low reverse band is on, and your gear ratio is 2.1. Right? All right, now, in drive, look at that. In drive, first, second, third gear, the forward, which is the rear clutch, is on. Intermediate front band is on, only in second gear. And in third gear, the direct clutch is on. This right here, the low roller clutch is holding, which is the one that won't go but one way. You know, it locks and it drives to go backwards. And then there's your gear ratio. Uh, second gear on, that one's on. See, you got to know which clutches are on. This is not even telling you anything about solenoids. It's only telling you about which parts of the transmission are holding or and so on. Internal leaks will usually show up in a particular range. You see a number, you see a question about that? Uh, if a, a, a forward clutch leak would have normal pressure in part reverse and neutral, but would have low pressure in all the forward ranges. That makes sense? Are you getting there? All right. I'd, I'd like to see some daring headlights over here. Nobody not know. All right. A direct clutch leak on a transmission that's equipped will show a pressure drop when the transmission shifts to third and low pressure in reverse because in most cases direct clutch is on third and reverse. See? Direct clutch is on third and reverse. So if you got this chart and you got your pressures, you can go right to where the problem is. Or you can move in the direction of it really fast. Okay? A restricted filter, I think there's a question about this on there, will usually show up as a gradual pressure drop at higher engine RPM because the filter cannot pass as much fluid as the pump is trying to draw. In other words, you get on it, and it's, it's like, you know what a fuel filter feels like when it's stopped up? It starts out doing pretty good, and then it starts to choke down, and this one here, the transmission do that. We actually, uh... Is that the one when the, uh, the cat can <laughs> Uh, yeah, the fuel filter. Now we actually did. We actually put a. Uh, this one guy brought a uh, brought a Nissan in here that had a. When you would start to drive off, it would quit pulling, and we changed the filter on that one and fixed that. Actually, I take that back. On that Nissan, we didn't change the filter. It was a steel screen, and you take it off and clean it, <laughs> and it was clogged up with crud. Which is kind of like an old one of the old Fords that they used to see. Ford and C6 had steel filters. Um, stuck pressure regulator valve will show up as fixed line pressure, which means the same pressure all the time. You got that? Same pressure all the time. See this right here? See the pressure regulator valve? Uh, that right there. Whenever that pressure pushes against that spring and it moves past the land, you see all the little things in there. You know, if you ever look at a transmission valve body, you've never seen one before. It scares the daylights out of you. Looking at all the little passages. The people that design those things and cast them in machine them, you know, they got to be pretty sure. Don't they? Faster RPM, faster pump speed with a stuck pressure regulator valve. The pressure may vary with engine RPM, which means low pressure at slow RPM and high pressure at higher RPM. If that pressure regulator valve is stuck and it can't regulate the pressure, the pressure may just follow the RPM. Around right, with a stuck pressure regulator valve, there will be no boost in pressure from the throttle valve or modulator system and no reverse boost. Remember, the throttle valve and modulator, or the, the throttle valve is either hooked to your foot, the modulator is hooked to the vacuum. Now, if you have a modulator valve, if you've got low vacuum, that's high engine load, it's going to hold gears longer. If you're deeper into the throttle with your throttle valve, you're basically going to hold gears longer, right? Anybody throws an automatic transmission, and you're going to stand on its stroker because the bandit's on your tail, you're going to feel it holding the gears a lot longer before it shifts, that's because you're into it deeper. Now, that's going to be your, uh, Little, uh, also, your throttle position sensor is going to tell you that on the electronic transmissions. And it's basically going to use your pressure control to do that instead of having a, you know, something to go there. Uh, so see, look at that, your, your balance pressure there. You might notice these lands will be different sizes and stuff. So if you think about your Pascal's law, if you've got a bigger land in one place than you do the other place, and the pressure goes in there, that's going to overcome and you know, push this way or that. You know? So we we'll talk about that a little more another time. There's a modulator right there. You screw that, this modulator got a vacuum line connected to it. If you ever unplug the vacuum line from a modulator, 
uh, you're going to see transmission fluid dripping out of it if it's bad because it's got diaphragm in there. And also, if they have a modulator, like on some of your older transmissions, they'll have a colored band around here. And there's on some of them, there'll be a little pin that's got to be the right length. That whenever you pull it out of there, you got to put that pin in there the right way. Uh, that's easy to change on the outside of the transmission. This old mobile got mine to where it one. And there, uh, there used to be a worksheet that I had, and there may still be one in there when uh, doing something that mine would All right, so if pressures are high and slow, I would indicate the pressure regulator is all about throttle pressure problem. On older cars, the mine later valve, that can trigger control throttle pressure. Pre electronic vehicles after that use a throttle valve cable. Chrysler always use a throttle valve, they never use a line pressure. Uh, check the book. Throttle pressure test point, where is it? If it has a throttle pressure tap, the pressure gauge is called there will tell you if the throttle pressure circuit is the problem. CV pressure should rise with throttle increase. Give it the gas, the pressure ought to go up. That's on your throttle valve. Not on your line, but on your throttle valve. Well, the GM units without a throttle pressure tap remove the TV plunger. If the line pressure is now normal, then it's a TV problem, not a throttle valve problem. If not, it's a pressure regulator problem. So you can sort of track it down there on that. Um, the reverse stall test is also a maximum output pump output test. If you got a weak pump, this test will help find it. Uh, this will show up the low pressure at reverse stall, but all other pressures, including out, will be normal. See, so that's going to give you a, it's also a maximum pump. I see if you do that, you're testing to see what your pump can do. What's your actual Now, this one here, you're going to have a sheet uh, that I gave you on the GMC or on one of them Chevy pickups, where you basically hook a pressure gauge up to the transmission, and you take your, uh, this is, we did this with older tests with this old OGC uh, Genesis, but we got these other ones. You can actually tell your, you know, go to your, uh, where you're controlling your actuators, and if you go to your electronic pressure control, you can tell it to raise that pressure and watch and see if it raises it. So you're looking at your scan tool and your pressure gauge side by side, and you're watching this, and you're gonna tell it to go up, go up, and it'll, see that, it's pretty cool. You know, it's how I took it. This was a video, but I said, you know, why watch the video because you can see what's going on here. All you got to do is make it your own step that up, you know, and see if it's changing. All right, got plain transmission slip on a uh, P1870 code or a 4L60E. This is GM's thing. Um, Adam Snap was the one that told me about this because he used to have to do it in the Chevrolet thing. Got plain input speed. If vehicle speed sensor RPM is 2,000, then multiply it by the ratio of the gear being checked. You got another ratio where it's going to work. So I assume the overdrive ratio is 0.696. Multiply that by times 2,000 will give a proper engine input speed reading of 1392. If there's no slip, see if it's slipping, those numbers won't line up, right? You ever feel one slipping? Crowd the throttle a little bit whenever you're driving down the road and it's going, uh, starts gaining, it just starts gaining speed when it's not supposed to. You know, you can see how that would be a slip, right? Uh, you can, you can also see if the torque converter is slipping by doing that same thing. Get it up there with it and block up with the torque converter engaged, crowd the throttle at about 45 miles an hour. And if it starts, you know, if the, if the engine starts gaining speed and the vehicle doesn't, you know, you got slippage there. Now, you can't always tell where it is, but you know where it is. You know that you got slippage. Uh, assuming the overdrive ratio is 696 multiplied, see that's where we were if there's no slip. Now, subtract 1392 from the actual engine or input speed recorded, got like slip speed. If the engine speed is 1400, the slip speed RPM is 8. Y'all ready to do them calculations? Y'all look so confused. You got it? All right. The slip one, though, the BCM is looking for on GM linear transmissions is 130 to 800 for seven seconds. If it sees it exceed that spec, it's going to tell you that code. Uh, anything greater will give you a P1870. If you want to become really proficient with a transmission pressure gauge, listen to this very carefully now. Don't miss this. You should first put a pressure gauge on your own vehicle Leave it there for one week while you drive around and watch that sucker. Watch what it does all week long. Every time you drive the car, watch the gauge, but don't crash. Right. In one particular episode of this certain TV show, this man's sports car got hacked so it was hung in third gear but only go 50 miles an hour. And I said, okay, now how are they going to... I always look, do you ever, do you ever look in that, since you know a little bit about cars, you're watching these TV shows, you're going to see if, they're, if they know what they're talking about, right? Are they doing this right, or are they making it up as they go? Like sometimes they take jumper cable and hook it up to a battery, and they'll throw it in the water, and somebody gets electrocuted because the jumper cable's in the water. Eh, you ever see them do that? And they, you know, they, you know what I'm saying? They try to act like jumper cables will electrocute you. 
<laughs> you know, with hooked up to a car battery. But anyway, the good guy was a hacker, and he was connected to the sport car and engine controller remotely to find out what was going on. And in addition to discovering malware in a PCM, this was what his screen showed. Now that was only on the screen for just a minute, but when I saw that, I said, look at that. That's what you would see. A PO700 code and a PO783 3-4 shift malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They were. They did their. Whoever it was, it was teaching them to do what to show. You know, did this right. The information was only on the screen for a few seconds, but it blew me away. Said so this guy. This was real. You know, pretty cool. All right. So for now, for the test. You ready? Everybody, got all your questions answered. Uh, you don't have your questions answered. That's okay. We're gonna see what we got. Somebody give me an answer to that one. Is it A? Yeah. A. A. We're going to see how you do. We've got answers, we got answers coming up. You remember it being A, right? All right, if all pressures are within specs at slow level, what does it tell us? B. Huh? B. B. B, the pump regulator is the pump. Uh, when diagnosed and installed valve the modulator equipped system, what should you do first to install the pressure to RLO? C. Perform hmm? another test. You already, read, you already put that answer down? Mm -hmm. All right. If you think that's what it is, put it down, because we don't read it in a minute. If pressures are high at slow idle, what does this tell us? C. C. Mm -hmm. If pressures are at, at stall speed or high in every range, what should you do? C. Y'all are really not having very much to say here, are you? How can we look at the pressure and tell if the pressure regulator valve is stuck? Mm -hmm. How can a pressure test show you a restricted filter? Let's see. Stall testing should always be done in what? D. What was that? D. You said, yeah. is that yeah. Delta or Bravo? Delta. Yeah. Okay. How many of you would come better at recognizing abnormal pressure readings? C. Delta. Robert A. says it's best to start pressure tests by checking throttle valve pressure. Zach says it's best to start pressure tests by checking the main line pressure. Who's correct? That's it, Dakota, know what to sleep on. Anybody know? Mm -hmm. You already answered one. Trade paper for somebody. You got all your you got all your questions answered. Mm -hmm. No. You better start. Uh, Christmas tree. That's what I used to do. Christmas. All right. Hey, Christmas, sir. Appreciate that. I said they'd bring a ticket on the way down. There you go. Answer. Hey, hey, hey. Come on. Ready? Uh, yeah. right. A. Mm -hmm. B. Mm -hmm. D. Mm -hmm. A.